Okay, approve. so after a quite an adventure of uh, technical debugging, yeah, we won. We did it. We won. <laughs> we did not heroic to... of you. You were heroic, Willie. Thank you. Thank you. It's that ESTO training I got. I have to. <laughs> I have to get down to the bottom of it. No, I'm, a, I'm an evaluator, so I did have that training. So I'm uh, relentless and trying to get a why. Okay. All right. So we are here. This is our third conversation uh, with Mr. Ken. I think we're going to call these the the U files at the end. Uh, okay. like the X files. We'll have the U files for the <laughs> Urquhart files. We have a lot of information. And uh, as far as I can see, we're going to be having several more um, conversations. So this will be a, probably our, our our biggest series yet on this channel, uh, documenting the original practitioners of dynamics and Scientology and the people that knew Ron the closest. So Ken, we've talked a lot about um, Ron, a lot about some of the good things and the bad things about the tech and the man himself. And when we left off last time, you had mentioned, you know, some of the circumstances regarding you leaving the church and how you ended up reconnecting uh, via David Mayo. Yeah. So could you tell us a little bit about your relationship with David Mayo and what were his circumstances regarding leaving the church? And kind of like fill us in on, on that whole uh, segment of your history. Okay. He and I had a fairly good re working relationship on the ship when he was the senior staff flag. Uh, I supported him when I he needed support from me. Uh, I guess he supported well. He supported me technically. As he's, I guess he CS my folder. Uh, we. We're both working at Clearwater. He was a senior CS there, and he became the senior CS int. I remember when I was still per first come, a, tele a fairly long telex came in from LRH to David, which of course I saw because it was from LRH. And they were, they'd been dealing with some kind of situation, and he ended this Telex to David by saying, you are the best CS in the world. That would have been probably around 77. Uh, I had very little contact with David until that time when I I was expecting to be declared a, a list one RSer, and I went to see him, really to sound him out. But I think that was the last time I, no, it wasn't. That was the last time I spoke to him before he left to go out west to be with LRH. The next time I saw him was when I was an LRH, when I was a not auditor in the flag, not, uh, not HGC, he came on a mission to that HGC, and we all had to do videos of our session for the mission to see. And then David set up a meeting in the morning where all of the, the NOTS auditors assembled, and he showed the videos one by one. And I was putting off doing my video because I was just shit scared. <laughs> 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 I had terrible stage fright for one thing. But the other thing was that he was very scathing about <clears throat> just about all of the auditors who were turning in videos. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm not going to survive this attack. <laughs> so, but the, the the day came. I think it was the third day, and I couldn't put it off any longer. I chose to video a session I was doing on a, a staff member. I forget exactly how exactly I got to auditor, but I think she wasn't well, 
and I just took her on. And we had we started the session. I had the video on, and I had to do a knots twenty four. And I got to the 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 very early question about what was right for one was wrong for another. And I I started the question and I couldn't get my tongue around it. I was so nervous. So I just switched the video off so I could do the session. <laughs> I did the session and I turned the video in without saying a word. <laughs> so I had turned the video in. <laughs> and then later that day, Jill, I wanted to say Jill Karstrom, she was Jill Gleason by that time. She was the nuts, one of the senior CS is at, at Flag, and she came to me and said, your video didn't record. You'll have to do another one. So the next day, I felt a bit stronger <laughs> and started the video. I, in the in the, the first session where I did the video that I switched off, uh, we, we came across something which we handled to a regular standard not Session EP, BDFN, wide FN. So her, I started the session the next day when I am decided I'm just going to video it all. And she suddenly comes forward. She jerks right up in her chair and she says, was there anything left on what we handled last session? And I immediately went into almost panic because here was something I had to handle on video. But I managed to retain enough presence of mind to be watching the needle as she was speaking. And as she was referring to this thing that we'd handled, her needle was floating. So I said to her, I took it that we had, meaning that we'd handled everything on it. Then I said, did you feel that there was more on it? And she says, no, I just wondered. And she relaxed right back into her chair and we're back in session. So the next morning we go in for our videos and mine just doesn't come up until almost the very end. And I'm wondering what on earth is he going to say? <laughs> Keeping it to the end. I was going to say, very well done for handing that origination. <laughs> well, I'm thinking, well, I, I'm just thinking automatically I messed up. Ah, gotcha. Right. It, it, you know, if it was me, I messed it up. <laughs> so he played this little scene, this little TR4 thing. He stopped the video and he turned to the group and he said, what happened there? And there was an auditor sitting in the front row under his nose, and he said, wasn't that Q&A? And David looked at him. He, that guy had had two or three videos already, and every time David had critiqued it, his action as being Q&A. Mm -hmm. So he said, no, Joe, whatever his name was, <laughs> that was not Q&A. You Q&A, that was not Q&A. So then there was silence. Nobody else wanted to volunteer. And then David said, that was a perfect example of TR4. Exactly right. That's what yeah, I yeah. saw. That's what I saw. I was like, well, that's... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he, he went through the tape and he explained what was happening. And, and uh, then he had them give me a round of applause. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Senior so the, <laughs> the next person and the last video he played that morning was the first video that he gave a pass to. Now, he didn't say, with regard to mine, he said, the auditor's metering is good, his TRs are good, and his TR4 is excellent. That's all he said. But the, the last one, he said, he gave that a pass. So I assume that mine wasn't a pass. Hmm. But, you know, they, they then put up a, a, 
a roll of honor to show all of the orders that had passed. And then the, my name was second. So I guess he did give it a pass. Anyway, uh, the other thing that happened on that mission was there was a situation at Flag that really bothered me, and I couldn't get anywhere with it. And I, I actually Q&A'd with it because, you know, in the not instructions, there's the, the tech is that if you do a date locate, you check to see if a date or a location was wrong for another. Right? So I do my first date locate in a not session, and I'm sent to cramming. Because what I did was I completed the date locate to a blow of what we were addressing, and then I checked if a date found had been wrong for another or location wrong for another. And I was crammed that every time you found a date, you checked if it was wrong for another. When you went, when you went down the chain, every time you got a date, you checked, is this wrong for another? Hmm. That drove me around the bend. Hmm. Because there's, there's, if there's no bad indication, why are you checking something? Why aren't you going with the flow? Right. So... I expressed my objections very clearly. I was crammed again on the subject, and somehow I got through the, the crammer back in the chair, and then I thought to myself, well, third cram, and I'm in retrain, or retread. And I don't want that. So I did it their way. But very happily, one of David's actions on the mission was to... He put out a question a questionnaire asking different questions. And one of the questions was, is there any arbitrary you have come across? And I thought, boy, you wait till you hear what I have to say. So I told I wrote that out and then he, he issued a correction saying that the way I was interpreting the bulletin was correct. So we didn't have that nonsense anymore. Did he back it up with references, or was he just like, no, this is the way I see it? <clears throat> no, uh, you can't remember. Okay. He definitely, he definitely at least referred to a principle, like fast flow or something like that. Sure, sure, okay. But it was it was something to him that was so elementary and obvious he didn't really get into the technical underpinnings. Gotcha. It was just too silly. Right. Okay. So that was all good. I didn't hear anything else from Mayo or about Mayo until a little later. I was, I think I was still auditing. I was summoned to a meeting with the CMO in the Clearwater building, the bank building, up the road from the Fort Harrison. And a one of the senior CMO messengers called Rosie, Rosie Kroger, she spoke to me, and to my complete amazement, she says, we're, we're looking for an ED in. We have the short list, and you're number one. Will you take the post? And I, at first, I was very excited. And I didn't accept it. I said to, I asked Rody if I could think about it for a few days, but it didn't take me that long. At first, I was thinking, well, the first thing I'd really like to do is to go on a tour of all the orgs. Mm. I'd speak to all the staff, especially the tech staff, and some of the people in the field. And I get to know them, and I get to a feel for how things are out there. And then immediately, I realized that would never happen. Because you don't do that in the Sea Org. In the Sea Org, you get bright and brilliant 
you have a super idea and you get into action right away. <clears throat> and then, I, of course, I would have been told, well, we have the, the, the admin system and the flag bureau to get observations on the orgs. They had a file for every organization and various bits and pieces of paper, including the stats, went into those folders. And when they needed to do an eval, they would go through the folder and find the out points and, you know, take it from there, do the eval. Or they might send a, an observation mission. But anyway, I didn't have a lot of faith in those folders myself. So then I, I sent a little memo into Rosie and I said, how does this post relate to the CMO and the Guardian's office? No answer. Hmm. Stupid question. So I then thought it about what it some more, and then I knew I could see what was going to happen. They would put number one on the post, give him a very hard time, and then shoot him down in flames. <laughs> So that they could say to number two, look what happened to him. So you do what you're told. Right. Toe the line. <clears throat> yes. So I then, uh, I, I think I wrote to, to Rosie and said, no, thank you. But during the conversations I had with Rosie, I mentioned that one of my little problems was that I hadn't been home to see my father and my stepmother since 1968. And that was 10 years, almost 10 years. So next thing I know is I'm assigned to, as a, a tech missionary on a mission to St. Hill, UK. So I get paid to go over there. I mean, I, my fare is paid over there and back, and I'm given a leave at the end of the mission to go and visit with my father and stepmother. That was nice. Yeah. And while I'm at St. Hill on this mission, I see a, a flag order, and it says EDN, or Executive Director International, Ken Urquhart is appointed. So I get busy, and eventually it's dropped. I understood later that it was David Mayo who put pressure on the CMO up wherever he was to tell him to, to cool off and to accept my refusal, which was I'd be very grateful for if he did. While I was on that mission, I, that was not long after the bulletin had come out uh, saying that whenever you got a read, as on a, a rudiment or a, an auditing question, you would find out whose charge it was. And I noticed that the OT3 review auditors at St. Hill were not doing that. So I checked with the St. Hill CS, and he says, no, we, that bulletin hasn't come to us yet. Mm. I, but then he said, I've seen a copy, and it's it's only for not. So I, I um, telexed David Mayo, pointing this out, that the OT3 auditors at St. Hill needed that. And he, his response was, okay, Issue the bulletin. And I'm thinking to myself, bloody hell, me? Issue a bulletin? Don't be silly. So I, I didn't. Well, that wasn't my hat mm -hmm. to issue a bulletin. <clears throat> and anyway, they, they, they got it sorted out very shortly afterwards. But I think that was the last time I had contact with David within the church. And after I left, 
I went went back to Wales to my father and stepmother, was there several months, and I got an offer from somebody I had audited at Flag, very generous, very kind offer, to fly me over to the States and give me a job. The unemployment at, in South Wales at the time was very high, and I wasn't getting anywhere, so I was very grateful to accept that invitation. I went over, was working in New Jersey. It didn't pan out as we both planned. And then one day, uh, I got a phone call from David saying he'd set up a center in Santa Barbara, and would I like to go? And with the, the agreement of the people I was with, I was, I think I was out within two or three days. Uh, he had set up a center in Santa Barbara with, you see, three, no, four people that he had worked with at Int, wherever that was in California. Mm -hmm. Well, five, because Julie was with him. And let me pause here for one second so I can get the timeline straight. So you had <clears throat> gone to the Sea Org, I paid for you to go to St. Hill. Oh, yeah. yeah, to St. Hill. You took a leave. Yes. Afterwards. And then you, you, you went to Jersey on this job offer? No. Sorry. I went to Wales on the visit, then I went back to Flag and resumed auditing. That's what I, okay, that's, that was my gap. I was like, okay, there. Sorry about that. Something, I missed something there. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, so then that then you covered that in our last interview where eventually you left. Um, yeah. Okay, so now we're going to round back to Mayo gives you an invitation. Yes. So I went out there and the the ARC was not high. And I think I I probably, well, I'm sure I did. I contributed to that because uh, the 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 unit, in my opinion, was not well run. It was he had we we were not all working well together. Mm. I'm difficult to work with to begin with. I know that. Or sh I should say I'm not easy. And uh, I can be critical and I, you know, I was a bit standoffish. It, and I was really puzzled as to why David had set up his organization in Santa Barbara more or less under the nose of the CLS in LA. And I thought, that, well, it's, you can be a red rag to a bull from a distance. Mm. But being a red rag to a bull under its nose is asking for a lot of trouble. <clears throat> we got a lot of trouble. However, he was fairly successful and he was making money and he moved into a nice new new uh, center. There was uh, an office upstairs, <laughs> which eventually the C of S rented so they could spy on him. They they gave him a very hard time, but uh, I was an auditor, and that's all I was. I wasn't interested in doing anything else. I think I think that's one reason why things didn't go too well. I think he expected me or wanted me to take a, a more senior role, <clears throat> kind of step up and help with your the, the management side of things. I'm assuming. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. But, uh, well, it just didn't 
still all that well. What did he say or what did you observe? Well, both, both. What did he say and what did you observe if you saw any of it or heard any of it regarding his ouster from the church? Because he was, you know, again, in a very close position to LRH. He was another man I would have loved to have interviewed, but, you know, that chance is gone. Deep insight into LRH, audit LRH, supposedly helped develop um, knots. Um, and I believe, that I believe. Um, so again, how could one of the closest, uh, confidants and apostles or whatever disciples, what you want to say, uh, to LRH get so mercilessly, uh, you know, removed from his, his position of, of power? What did you see there? Uh, I, I only heard bits of stories. Uh, I saw... The order that was put out on David, declaring him or dismissing him, and I I could see it was just a lot of bio. But as I think I mentioned before, I was a, it seemed to me that anybody who got close to LRH was always in danger of being thrown in the garbage. Uh, rapidly and noisily and on a whim sure but we don't we don't know the specific region that it occurred for him or did he ever did he ever delve into that that's what at least what no. he thought he got he got the boot no he didn't he didn't confide any anything about that to me I heard, I think he told me he'd been running around the tree. But no, my, my assumption was from what I saw in that issue that LRH just been being LRH to a un, rather unusual degree. He turned on an old friend and supporter and turned on him very nastily. Yeah. And un, unjustifiably. Right. Yeah, it makes you wonder because, um, you know, there's the whole, um, the I think it's an executive directive where it talks about, you know, David Mayer being a squirrel. Yes. Um, well, if, you, if you're so secure in your abilities and in your tech and whatnot, it falls on you to have not detected that way earlier. And it does, it's illogical. It's literally illogical. This guy, this guy helps you develop one of the most important pieces of tech on your bridge. How could he also be a squirrel? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's I'm illogical. Very, right. Contrary very, fact. You know, it's contrary yes. fact. Yes, exactly. And also, on the same line, David was reportedly called over to be with LRH to help him because LRH was dying. And David got him out of it. And from that particular action, uh, knots grew. Yeah, that's the same thing that I've heard. LRH was sick. I think he had like cancer on his head or I don't know, some kind of whatever thing he had. He was ill and Mayo kind of built him out. And that's how they kind of developed this tech together. Yeah. So it's kind of messed up that you would then say this is a massive squirrel because no yeah okay interesting why i i am emphasizing this and kind of we're you know delving into this point is again not to beat up lrh but it's a, to teach a lesson or learn a lesson about power mm -hmm. and about those connected to power mm -hmm. and that's the lesson to learn here it's not we're going to bash lrh for being grouchy and mean whatever it is when you're connected to a power you need to be very, very careful. Yes. And this behooves all of us for the future. Uh, as our movement continues to grow, as we reform, hopefully, the church, and get rid of Miscavige or put him in, you know, a different position, whatever. For the new guys that come into power, 
these same dynamics are going to come into play. So we need to be very careful as to their megalomania and their rash decisions. And it needs to be a little bit more of a checks and balances, which yeah. had LRH had, like we, we had already talked about, maybe there we would have avoided some of these challenges. Very yeah. interesting. Very interesting. So thank you for insight on that. Um, okay, so the things weren't working well. The church was attacking Mayo. Can you share uh, shed any light on what they were ex exactly doing? Were they just showing up to his door and you know saying you're a squirrel, or were they throwing tomatoes at him? <laughs> what exactly were they doing to bother him? There was well, I was at that center. There wasn't anything terribly over, like demonstrations or people coming, yelling and throwing stones. No, mm -hmm. it was mostly legal. Okay, so accusing him of violating copyright, trademark, that kind of stuff. But I I wasn't in on it, but whatever they could have, you know, it's just their way. Whatever they can attack with, they attack with. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't wasn't directly involved in any of it. I think I had a meeting or two with his lawyer in Santa Barbara. I was not involved in the legal until after I'd left and I was living in Miami. And then the church's lawyers came, I think, three times to depose me. Regarding his the AAC? Yes. What do they want to know? Uh, to tell you the truth, I can't remember. It was uh, they had a, this. I was, I think, I was deposed mostly by the the lawyer Yanni, and Yanni had a very high opinion of himself. Uh, maybe quite correctly, so I don't know. But anyway, it was mostly about him feeding his ego one way or another. That's what I thought. Gotcha. Okay. All right, so then you're at the AAC, you're seeing these attacks, you're wondering why the heck did he start a um, competitor to the church literally an hour and a half away from its headquarters where they have full access to just bother you day in and day out. Did not make sense to me. Okay, so carry on. What happens next? Uh, I was auditing there fairly successfully. I wasn't in any trouble that I knew about as an auditor. Then one day I had a pre-OT came in who was he had, he had some, I think he had OT3 or something like that. And then he started not with some other auditor who was there. Then he came to me. He had to leave and go back for business reasons. And he asked if I could go out there and stay in his house and continue the knots auditing. And David Mayo agreed to that. So in due course, I went out there. While I was out there, I was in touch with an old friend from St. Hill who had been in the Sea Org and left it. She was living near New York City. Uh, we met. She was interested in some auditing. I gave her a DAP interview, which went very nicely for her. And she said to me, I can get you Pre-OTs. So I thought, well, that's, that's an, an avenue that's opening up. And it sounds more promising than the avenue I'm on right now. So I encouraged her to do that. I went back to Santa Barbara and I heard nothing from her for a couple of months. And then I wrote and said, you know, what happened to our little project? So she got busy and got me some Pre OTs, and I left. Now, by that time, she was living in Miami, so I, that's where I went. Okay. And there were some adventures there because 
there were there was a group of people who had been on staff at Miami Org for years and years, and they had made no progress towards clear. And when I got there, I was auditing people on nuts. And these staff members were on at me to help them get to clear and beyond. I wasn't too willing to get into that because I'm, I was just on my own. I was not really experienced in managing a group of people and getting them through their actions properly. Mm -hmm. There was a class eight auditor for the, I mean, north of Miami, and apparently she had been in touch with these people. They, they had all been in touch, and she had offered them, so I found out later, to take them through whatever they needed for, I think, half a day a, a week, half a day at a weekend. And that didn't indicate to them as something that was going to help them too much. So when I appeared, they were they pressured me to take them on hard. And eventually I gave in. I couldn't say no anymore. And these were current staff or former staff? Former staff. Gotcha. Okay. So then I find out that this Class 8, a, friend, a mission auditor, who of course left the church by then, she had had an agreement apparently with those people to be their terminal, their auditor and, and supervisor up the, for the, through the advanced courses. And she called me as soon as she heard that I had agreed to take them on, and she said, complained to me for an hour and a half. So eventually I said, okay, they're all yours. I mean, I, I hadn't been trying to hold on to them. Right. I was just listening to her complain. She didn't stop. <laughs> she finally wound down and I said, okay, they're all yours. Take them. But the the people involved, the staff members who wanted to move on, they wouldn't have it. They were not interested anymore. So I was kind of left holding that baby. Mm. I got myself into it. Yeah. And that that went okay, but not really very well. So where are we? So but and that uh, I think that upset David and his crew to some extent because I think they were there was some connection with this mission auditor who was further north of Miami and there was some expectation that these people would go to her and then to the AAC. <clears throat> gotcha. Somehow Ken messed up that line. Yeah. That led the flow of PCs. Yes. Gotcha. So did you end up auditing them, or did you end up leaving I, halfway, or, or what happened? I trained them, trained to, them to solo audit on three. Uh, and they were already at that level? You didn't have to bring them up to the grades, to the lower grades? Yeah. Level? No, yeah, yeah. They were, uh, they were all clear. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, any was there basically their solo course, get through one and two quick, and then... Yeah do the work okay yeah. um i don't think i did a terribly good job but <laughs> why would you say that does not your pcs weren't winning or complaints or what happened uh the results were a bit mixed mm. but i i actually i was not qualified to do that work on that larger group gotcha Gotcha. Which was really why I was unwilling. In the first place. In sure. the first place, yeah.
Yeah. Okay. So then uh, more upset with David. Uh, did you have contact with him after that? Or was it kind of done at, at that point once this whole Miami fiasco happened? I don't think I had any more contact with him until uh, years later. They had the church lost their suit against him. He won a suit against them, his counter suit, and got money. Mm. But he wasn't talking to me. He, he was not. He was keeping very quiet. Generally, he set up business in the Dominican Republic, and he. he was delivering services there. And for some or somehow he got kicked out of the Dominican Republic and he came back to the States. I by this time I was living in New Jersey. I was in South Orange. And I got a call one day and it's David. And he said to me, he said, I'm I'm I had to leave Santo Domingo, and I'm here in Miami. I need some business. Could you please give me the num the names and numbers of the people you were working with when you lived in Miami? And my first thought was that he had a nerve asking for that. I didn't know that I was so much obliged to him. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel I was. And he didn't, he was not really friendly. But I thought to myself, he's, he's in a very tight spot. He needs the business. And the people down there could do with the auditing, I'm sure. So I gave him the names and numbers. I never heard from him again. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> no, I'm, not, nice. I'm not saying that as a criticism of him. We weren't <laughs> just we're not that close. Yeah. Years later when I heard out for her I got the news that he had passed on. I had a I sent a message to Julie. Now wait a minute. I had contact with him. The year before he died, mm. because I was I was auditing in a situation that was a little bit difficult, and I needed CS rep, uh, support, and I wasn't getting it. And I e uh, found his email address, and I emailed him and asked him who he could recommend. And his reply really surprised me. He says, you don't need a CF. He says, you have ARC, an understanding. He was very complimentary about my auditing mm. and my technical abilities, far more than I felt was could possibly be justified. Anyway, he didn't recommend a CF just told me to get on with it. Uh, and I just couldn't be sure if he really meant it or if he was being one one. And knowing him from the past, he could be very one one. He mm. could be. Mm. He was very often one one about admin exec. Yeah. Did, did not like them. I couldn't blame him. So that that was my last contact. Then later I heard that he had passed away and I sent a message to Julie of um, g giving her my condolences and I didn't hear back. So I don't know if she got it or not, but if she did, she didn't reply. Gotcha. Okay. Similarly, that's Mayo. That's the Mayo Odyssey. <clears throat> Same kind of question, but regarding a Pat. I don't know how, how you pronounce his last name. It's either Broker or Brooker or 
We knew, him as, we knew him as Pat Broker. Broker. Okay. So what was your relationship with him if you had one? And what did you hear along the lines of why he left or why he got the caboose after being named um, loyal officers and, and all that, him and Annie? Well, I knew him on the ship. His, his wife, Franny Broker, was a Commodore staff aide. She was CS3, which is the org division, the mm -hmm. treasury division, sorry. And he was, he was on finance lines. He might have been a finance rep or whatever they called him. I forget now. But he was on the money line, the ship money line. And he came to my notice because he got into, he found a way to get a line to LRH, which was always a big deal for anybody on the crew. Very big deal. And that line was that he would organize the purchase of very expensive presents. For LRH's birthday, and I think May 9th. But for the birthday, for example, one year, this was only about three or four years, but one year he got LRH and Mary Sue large platters made of gold. I forget what you call them. They're, they're big platters that you put in front of a person and then the dinner plate comes and it sits on that platter. A, a charger. Charger. Yeah. Is it a charger? I'm not sure. Anyway, it's maybe you're right. Yeah. Uh, so that was one thing. But the, the other thing that sticks out in my memory was he had... Uh, um, a, a name thing that you put on the desk. And it said L. Ron Hubbard in big, heavy letters. And it was on a big, heavy base. And it was all gold. Like solid gold. Solid gold. <laughs> and this was Pat's idea of, I guess, validating LRH. I thought it was nonsensical, vulgar, and a waste of money. And he, I, it was not a big priority of, for me to do anything about it. I had other other things to do and other fish to fry. Mm -hmm. uh, but LRH was accepting it. So I didn't have very strong grounds to object. Sure. Right. So the next thing I hear is he's off with Annie and the rest of the CMO. I hear nothing from him or about him until 19, must be 1978 or early 79. I was on the RPF. And there had been a big deal when I was put in the RPF about the fact that I wasn't a Sea Org member. I didn't care. I couldn't couldn't have cared less what they said about that. Completely unimportant. But Pat Broker was in clear water for some reason. And he came by the RPF and spoke to me. And he said, I thought you'd like to know that there were some people around LRH quite recently, and your name came up, and somebody said, well, he's not a Sea Org member. And LRH had said, he is a Sea Org member. So, I mean, it was decent of him to come by and seek me out and say that. Sure. 
because <clears throat> I might I might have been concerned about it. Sure, sure, sure. Um, as to why Ellerate said that, I I just guessed it was because I didn't put my hand up when he offered the RPF amnesty. But I don't know. Anyway, that there was that, and I I had no contact with him afterwards. I was out of the church, and I came across a copy of that flag order saying that LRH had gone to heaven or wherever he went. He went up to space somewhere. Mm -hmm. And he appointed Annie and Pat Broker, loyal officers and all that stuff. Yeah. And yeah. I read that and I I might have been wrong, but my knowledge of LRH and his style told me that LRH did not write that. That was not LRH at all. In fact, it was, there were, there were indications in that that it was kind of puerile, mm. adolescent, mm. really just not LRH at all. So I th thought to myself, I know who wrote that and for whom. Pat Broker wrote it for himself, put himself in a good position. Uh, so do you think this the, makes it very easy for Miscavige to have canceled that then? Because you know, if, you write, if Elrich writes this loyal officer thing and then like it gets canceled, like which is kind of like what happened, where this issue comes out and then no, nah, no, you're not loyal officers. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that that could have been something that allowed it to be undermined so 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 quickly and so fast and so easily that Ellerich never wrote it in the first place? I don't know. All I I've heard various things since then about what was going on, and I did ask years later. I did ask one messenger. How came David Miscavige to get control? And she told me, if I'm remembering exactly correctly, that LRH was more or less in hiding with, and he had Annie and Pat Broker with him. And, but he was in communication with the rest of the CMO and Pat Broker was managing the comm line and the security of the comm line. And so it was for when they had traffic for LRH, they would call Pat Broker and arrange to meet. And they would meet at some very remote place and they would pass over the traffic and get the returning traffic and Pat Broker would disappear to they didn't know where. And and the messenger who had met Pat Broker would return to the CMO and the traffic would get distributed. And very often, Pat Broker would insist that the meeting in this remote place would be at night. And there was one messenger who didn't like going to such a remote place on her own at night mm -hmm. so it was arranged for in her place somebody else would go and that someone just happened to be David Miscavige and then he apparently he took over the line he became the regular person to do that so he and, and Broker became like that mm -hmm. And it's, I would say that what they did was David Miscavige and Pat Broker made sure that what went through to LRH was what suited them best. And it's also said that Pat Broker and David Miscavige would go off on joints and have fun uh, at the expense on, on org money and do other things. It, it, 
I really don't know. I shouldn't really say that they were doing anything wrong, but I'm told that there was they were naughty. They had withhold. It's hearsay, but it's it, there's been several sources of this hearsay. So right. you know, when there's smoke, there's fire somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Generally, not always. Generally, yeah. yeah. Well, apparently, the then after LRH died, the key happening was that Pat, Pat and Annie were away from the ranch where they'd been staying with LRH, and and Miscavige had found out where they were, where that ranch was. And while they were away, he went there. And uh, he went there for one reason. This is what I'm told. And that was to pick up the OT8 materials. And he got them. And from that moment on, Pat Broker had no hold over him. Interesting. That's what I'm told. I can't say it's history. Well, that's a piece of data. It's a piece of data. It's not fact, right? We don't know. We can't. We can't describe it as a fact, but it's a data point. So maybe because one of the things that I've always been very interested in, and I collect data on, is those final years. There's so much stuff that doesn't make sense. So much right. stuff that just is so illogical and bizarre and flat out stupid that I need to get more and more of this information so eventually I can kind of piece things together. And of right. course, if anyone out here watching knows Pat Broker or Broker or whoever pronounced his last name, I want to talk to him. I want to get him on here and in a friendly way, I want to get to the bottom of what exactly happened in those final years because I doubt I'm going to get it from Miss Cavage's mouth. Um, but if I can get Pat to, to share some, shed some light, would be helpful to all of us. <clears throat> okay, so I, sorry for that tangent, but uh, okay. So, who do you think he got the OTA material from? Who? Which who? Um, Which Miscavige. Who? When when he went to the to the ranch, yes. Did you think? Uh, did you hear that he met with LRH to get the OTA material? No. Or okay, LRH had gone. Elrich was dead. Oh, he was already gone. Yes. That, that makes sense. Okay, so he, he's gone. Elrich is gone. A little homeboy comes and grabs the OT8 material somehow, some way, probably through intimidation or something like that. If we're going to spec, if we're going to speculate, might as well speculate all the way. Yeah. <laughs> intimidate right. somebody, grab yeah, yeah. the stuff. I understood he got into the safe. Okay. Where they were kept. Or maybe he took the safe. I don't know. Just, and just OT8. Did he take the rest of the stuff, or was it just OT8 that was written up there? I don't know. Okay. And then Pat Broker basically has nothing left because he, he had, I guess, that was his leverage. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember that LRH had, had left wherever he was in a hurry to go to the, that remote place where he was hiding out. And his I would say almost invariable practice when he had to move was he would take somebody with him, a couple of people, or maybe a small group. Mm -hmm. But in order for the the unit that he was leaving to remain operational, he would take a couple of people that were not vital. Okay. So we know that he took Pat and Annie because he thought they were not, you no, know, not all that important. Very interesting. Not top. They were not heavyweights as far as he was concerned. To the management of the organizations. In other words, he could take them off the line and nothing would, would crash. That's correct. You know, that, that was his almost invariable practice ever since I started working for him. That's how the Sea Org got set up. That's an interesting perspective, and one that I hadn't considered. I had considered the 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 opposite. That oh no, he's going to take the best of the best to have around him. Uh, no. Wow. 
See, this is why we have to have these conversations. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Sea Org was begun with people from St. Hill that were not very important. The expendables. They were not very important, yes. And they ended up, you, it, and it happened again when he left Clearwater and set up the CMO out wherever he was. And he didn't, I don't think he understood that for the people who were left behind, the important people who were now subservient to this new senior level, issuing orders down into the old level that was left behind. And they were people that, didn't, that weren't really respected all that much by the people they were now pushing around. Yeah. Which breeds automatically. It was a, yeah, it was not, it wasn't a good organizational dynamic. Right, it, it, this is a uh, it's human nature. I don't care if you're OT ninety seven, whatever yeah. you think you are, you see some rather incompetent or mediocre person. I'll tell you, this happened to me when when I was a, Ma a Miami Org as a staff member. We oh had, yeah, we had an expediter, so sitting there, you know, stamping or tickets to go watch a film or, you know, personality test. Meek, she had this wild hair, you know, she looked, she just looked something from like 1970, very out of, out of touch. Um, and all of a sudden somebody named her the EO. <laughs> so this, this very insignificant, barely competent being all of a sudden is the cop. She is the police force of the org. And nobody really took her seriously, which I think made her even more insecure and more of a lunatic. Because she was just a jerk. Just like conditioned and this and, and just like it was a nightmare. But I can yeah. see how that, if you amplify that, could have turned, you know, all the old competent executives into you know, resentful people because now you've got these, especially if they're teenagers, giving you orders, you're like, who the hell are you? <laughs> you know, you're not even tech trained and you're giving me these these orders. Um, so that kind of explains a lot. Yeah, that's, a, that's another uh, viewpoint that I hadn't really considered where, you know, there, there, there's not an automatic respect there just because you have a title. You have to kind of prove yourself and earn it in any group. Yeah. In any group, and then yeah. you have these, these the young ones come coming up from the CMO, yeah, who probably pissed off all the old execs because yeah. who, who are you guys? <laughs> you know, I reminded of one of my first experiences when I became an exec myself when I was first LRH Com at Saint Hill, and this this is not quite what we're talking about, but. It, it was it was such a horrible experience. I hated having to do it. I was at Rage Comet St. Hill, and one day, not long after I'd been up post, we were in the monkey room at St. Hill, the big room, and suddenly at the door at the far end was LRH, and he was pointing at me. So I had to go to him, and he said that Ray Thacker, who had been the, who was the registrar in London, had replied to a telex, and her reply was unsatisfactory. And LRH dictated a telex to me to send to Ray. And I felt obliged to obey because the paper would be there in evidence or it wouldn't be, and that would be evidence. So I was, I was kind of caught. Mm -hmm. But the telex that he did takes it for me to send to Ray was so nasty and aggressive and just horrible. I thought, and I had to sign it like it was from me. <laughs> I knew Ray, and she was a lovely person. She was a great reg. She was friends with everybody. 
I had to send this stuff, and I did send it. And uh, I, I've always shuddered to think about it ever since. But that could happen. And the, the when the Sea Org was set up, and the missions were starting to come into St. Hill, the first missions, they were extremely nasty. Were they? Absolutely. Yeah. Knife in the wall. I had wondered in the if, if it was a progression that they got nasty, but you're telling me they started off nasty. Oh, dreadful. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think that brings us back to the point of power. Yeah. I think I always felt that LRH had a misunderstood or at least a misconception about power. He did say that a person would, was only of value to the degree that he served. He did not live that way. And his interpretation of the concept of power seemed to be seemed to match that of a bully. Mm. Power was how, to what degree you dominated others and got your own way. Right. In yeah. practice, that's how it worked out. Right, in practice, because his writing is quite different. It um, can be, yeah. It can be. There is, you know, green on white where he's pretty, you know, tough. Now, would you describe that as, because you had, you had, I think in our first interview, you had mentioned like a dichotomy of low tone LRH and high tone LRH. Yeah. Was this prevalent throughout both valences? Or would you say this was kind of like after 65 that he started to act this way? Yeah. Well, I would say it was after 66. 66. Yeah, 66. After he was, was re refused permission to continue to live in. Great Britain. Great Britain, which is after his Rhodesia adventures. Yes. Um, okay. So again, kind of that, the, what you refer to as the R6 valence shift. Yeah. And uh, prior to that, you would you say he operated differently? Yes. So he didn't have that kind of thing, uh, that power thing? No. Interesting. While I was, <laughs> while I was working as his butler valet and his household officer in the manor. He was consistently kind, friendly, respectful, courteous, but always kind and friendly. He was a pleasure to be around most of the time. Always. Incredible. Um... So so far we have we're gonna solve this 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 mystery like Scooby Doo. Uh, we have for some reason he changed valences after. I guess you know he decided to get tough. The proper valence was to be tough. Um, yeah, but nowhere to keep him in check and assign a condition. I think he's got an uh, unhandled condition and also unhandled bypass charge according to. Yeah. We've, yes, we've learned from from other rules and other stuff. Um, but I think we can sum it up to say, and this is going to ruffle some feathers, that the Scientology's problems are not just because of miscavige, but they also spring right from LRH directly. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. So this one needs to be confronted. This has to be confronted and accepted and said. You know, you don't throw out the baby with the bath, bath water. There's value here. Eloise is brilliant. I consider him a great man, a peer. Um, nothing. There's no hate towards the man. No. But there is an understanding that there are issues. And I think he's brilliant enough that he actually designed a self-correcting movement. Mm-hmm. You might have to be external to it to fix it, but the mechanism is there. The mechanisms of, of fixing it are there. I just don't know if you're imprisoned in that system, whether you can do it. And as a staff member, I tried and I couldn't. I got wrecked. <laughs> I got wrecked. 
I mean, as soon as I handled that one situation, which is major, major outpoints and SP, it is nasty. Uh, several situations. Oh dear! It was kind of like, oh, you know, hero stuff is happening. Uh, I got targeted. So, yeah. power is a delicate thing, and power is mm -hmm. something that we need to study and avoid. Some of the the uh, the nastier human emotions and politicizings and things which tend to happen. Uh, yeah. So. It's a cautionary tale. Scientology and L. Rachel are definitely a cautionary tale. But I think with a happy ending. We're not going through the happy ending right now, but I think we'll get there. How do you feel about that? Do you feel we're going to get there or do you feel, you know, it's just kind of hopeless? Regarding reforming Scientology itself. Yeah. I, I'm very much a pessimist. But I'm a pessimist about a broader situation, and that is simply the, the fate of mankind as a whole. I hope I'm wrong. I'm certainly not asserting that I'm right. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that man, mankind has set himself up to be going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, as Ellerich used to say, and he's well over. And I don't think it's, I don't think he's going to avoid catastrophe. If there's not to be a catastrophe, it will take a miracle. And that miracle could happen. But I think that it's very likely that we will be in such force dynamic turmoil within the next few generations, that there'll be no time for Scientology. People will be just too busy trying to find somewhere to live and then trying to find shelter and food, water and clothes for their children. And I think it's it will very quickly get to a point where there will be such civil disorder that there will be social chaos because the police and the army <clears throat> and the armed forces, they will all be hungry and thirsty and cold and they'll all be wanting food for their children. It'll be a free for all. I think. Yeah, you're not the only one that thinks that way. There's a lot of dystopian stuff um especially if you go to YouTube, an alternative. I mean, even the, mass, the, the major media is starting to hint towards um, challenging times ahead <laughs> due to the euphemism. Um, I have a little bit more hope. I've right. been where you were at for a while, a while ago, and then I started to change my mindset a little bit. I work two different people, so we have obviously two different things, uh, two different points of view. Um, but it is if if we don't take action, I absolutely agree with you. If we don't, if that miracle, that hail mary pass in football, ha something has to happen drastically and dramatic for things to to change course. Because this is not only um, where we're heading now, but you know, it seems like it's programmed mm -hmm. and predicted. And even the Bible, it's like there's a whole bunch of people just waiting for this catastrophe to come as a, even a self-fulfilling prophecy. Whether nobody could have that vision or nobody was pre-programmed to, to, to this end, um, it's becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy because it's like we can't do anything about it. it, it there's... I mean, every day you, you wake up and it's just more horror and stupidity. <laughs> you know, you, you and I have conversed via email. You know, my point of view of this, like the, the stupidity of this planet, it's just mind boggling and it gets stupider <laughs> every day where it's like, I have to laugh because it's just so ridiculous. Uh, but this is my long winded way of getting to this point for this question is if we were to have a chance of turning this around, 
Is there any single piece of tech that could be, be even just an HCOB or an HCOPL or a book or a line out of a book that you think could turn things around? If we were to say, okay, let's just apply this and somehow get it out in a big way to make a big impact, this could totally change things and stop this dwindling spiral on earth. What would that be? What would you, of all the stuff you've encountered in, in LRH's work, what could be applied so that we stop this madness? I haven't considered the, that question very deeply. My mind goes immediately to the tone scale and the handling of the tone scale, the handling of people at various points on the tone scale. Individuals, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, but then I think if you were going to emphasize that, you'd have to you'd have to have you'd have to go into a, a very thorough hatting of people on the time scale and how you handle it, but. I think you would have to do it on a basis which is completely not sea org. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to do it on a basis of everything everything that you do has to be according to um, I'm repeating an old Sufi teaching. Everything you do has to be necessary it has to be true and in accordance with the truth and it has to be kind yeah that would bring you into a state if you if that could be done by enough people that could result in a, in a condition of power so we applied scientology with kindness hmm. absolutely first thing first thing Okay, that's a good message. I think um, starting here and now, anybody's looking at this and you're a Scientologist, the whole the old toughness over mm -hmm. everything else, toss it. It doesn't work. It that's hasn't bullying. worked. That's bullying. Yeah. We're that's not part of ARC. Yeah. ARC. Um, let's look at LRH's valence before 66, because it seemed to be a more successful valence. And although there's tech after that, that's fine. But his valence and some of the PLs that were developed, you know, we don't necessarily have to apply them with that hatred, that anger, mm -hmm. that power dynamic. You can, you can take anything and apply it one of two ways or one of many ways. You can use the conditions and totally degrade somebody or build them up. Yeah. So I think every piece of tech is like that. If I wanted to really cave somebody in with Dianetics, I know how to do that. I can just leave them in an engram and leave them in an implant. It'll probably give them cancer. You know what I mean? It's that powerful. So you can totally choose how to apply this material. And I've seen it done both ways. I've seen ethics applied with a lot of ARC and I'm, I'm trying to educate you into a little better frame to make you more resourceful. Yeah. So I've seen like you are literally a piece of dog crap and this is for you to somehow be worthy again in my eyes. You know what I mean? Two, same thing, two different ways to do that. And if we're going to have a shot, listen to Ken. Kindness. The tone scale, I think, is a very good entry point, like you like you suggest, because it hits at some very basic and easy principles. Below 2.0, you're kind of nuts. <laughs> very simply put, there's a line of demarcation, and it's a generalization, of course. Things are on black and white, but just below 2.0, that communication that comes out, the artwork that comes out, the decisions that come out, the policies that come out, all got a little, a little dirt on them or something. 
So be careful with that kind of person who's generally at that level. <clears throat> also, the art that you expose yourself to, the music that you expose yourself to, if it's at that 2.0 or below, careful because you are able to be affected by all that. Above 2.0, it's not perfect. You know, person who's conservative can drive you nuts if you're a cheerful person because you're just simply like, yes, I mean, you want to get things done and they're kind of like holding you back. But recognize that that's not as bad as somebody who's even in grief. You might think someone in grief is, you know, a victim to be held. Be careful with that. So those kind of like basic principles, the chart of human eval aligned with the tone scale, the science of survival, called science of survival for a reason, um, could be also be an excellent entry point. And it's not even that difficult to understand. They even made, uh, I'm sure you've seen this, the, the illustrated tone scale in full with the little, uh, yeah. little fuzzy people. Beautiful, because it's very visual and easy to understand. So, yeah. And what would that also do? It would help alleviate a lot of PTSSB situations. Because those guys below 2.0 are mostly the trouble point. You rarely find an SP who's, <laughs> excuse me, I'm spitting all over the place, who's cheerful, <laughs> who's genuinely cheerful. Like, I'm going to go suppress me some people today. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's that right. serious or tight or that uh, person or the 1.1, which is the most notorious um, for being an SP around because he thinks they're they're friendly. So I'm going to make an admission to start getting getting these. After these videos are done, I'm going to start getting some of these basic precepts out and see if we can make a dent. And I, and I thank you for that, that suggestion um, because there's so much tech that it's hard to know where to begin <laughs> and that's a good one home skills is a good one anything else that you think we should also be broadly kind of disseminating or getting to practice yeah it, it came to me very clearly in remembering him tell me one day on the ship we were discussing there was a situation with where there were several people who had been put in condition for this that or the other and things were not going smoothly things were certain things were not getting done and he, he we were discussing this and he kind of shrugged it off and he says you know what these people really want mostly is just a good tr4 yeah <laughs> yeah very true I think, but um very true <laughs> yeah even uh, he, Understand what's happening and deal with it. But understand it first. Understand it first. And yes. Yeah. And make sure also that they feel heard. Because yes. just with a good act, I'm not saying I'm 100% my TRs are perfect. But with a good act, I've diffused so many situations and so yeah. many upsets and so many potential flaps. Yeah. And what I, what I mean by acknowledgement is not just a simple, okay, or I got it. I mean, let, what are you talking about? What, let me hear it. Okay, yeah. here's, okay, I fully get it. Here's my, really act, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Um, another, yeah, another great, a great point is, is, is TRs. Very basic, very understandable, and applicable. Anyone can practice TRs. Anyway. And if, if I may, I'll refer you to a book, not by a, a Scientologist. Well, I checked out the author, and, and as far as Google is concerned, he has no connection with Scientology. He was a policeman, and he wrote the book called Verbal Judo. Okay. Very interesting book, because that's all about TR4 and how a policeman on the street uses it to defuse all kinds of hairy situations. Very interesting. Verbal yeah. judo. Yeah, verbal judo. Excellent. I will check that. I'm actually going to write it down. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
So today we went through David Mayo and Pat Broker, some amazing revelations that we hadn't heard from <laughs> heard of before. Um, and the where, what, it's, it's, and some of the tech that's going to help uh, moving forward. I would say, Ken, don't give up. I mean, nobody knew me from anything last year. No Scientologist knew who I was or what. And they still don't know who I am, uh, widespread. But um, here I am doing interviews with some of the most important people in the movement, something which nobody else had really been doing besides uh, from a strictly critical viewpoint of like, let's talk as bad as possible about how to run Scientology. And uh, here I am, I just decided to do this and now I'm doing it. And there's right. more, more to come. Um, so don't lose faith. Don't lose hope. There's plenty of people out there that are just simply observing and waiting. I was one of them. And they're young and they're energetic. And I think that they're going to start becoming active and we can get something done. There is going to be turmoil because there's a lot of people that want it. Simple as that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, I, I think that overall, uh, as long as we have tools, we have a, have a shot. And as yeah. long as we don't get Scientology banned um, or allow it to be banned, um, as it has been in some countries in the past, um, we have a shot. It's not the, the final solution. It's not the only thing. But we combine it with other things. We combine it with verbal judo. What if we did a seminar about verbal judo and we talked with TRs? How wouldn't that help police officers so that they wouldn't have to shoot people? Come on, well, there's a lot of things that we can do in the world. So, so have faith, my friend. I think that um, things will get better. They might get a little crazier um, in the short term, but uh, with enough energetic people and enough wise older people like yourself to guide us, we can get something done. Well, yeah, but you have to organize. And that, that and that's a stickler. Yeah. That, that is a little bit of a stickler. Because um, who wants who wants to be organized these days? You're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guilty. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a third dynamic. Uh, at least at present, it used to be. Right now, uh, I'm trying to even envisioning myself working in a third dynamic. It just seems like a, a gi ginormous waste of time. I've tried it. We tried it, you know, and it's just been like, how can we waste more time and have more infights today than we did yesterday? <laughs> how can we disagree more today and waste more time on useless crap uh, than we did yesterday? So I was like, you know, I'll be I'll be lone wolf until um, there, there's a big enough of a, of a momentum. But yeah, you're okay. right. We we do need to organize. We do need to to come together. There's no way. An individual here, there, it's, it's sporadic, is going to take on uh, these very, very organized, if crazy, uh, beings that run run things now. The organized people are the art ethics people. Yeah, they're organized. Very. We're, they're good at it. <laughs> absolutely, they know how to do it. They're great at it, yeah. and at hitting the the triggers that. That cause people to do things and join them. You know, it's 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 they're so good. And Absolutely. We're, like, oh, well, we're so spiritual yeah. and we're getting this decimated. <laughs> well, he warned it. Uh, Elrich warned about it, right? So OTs individuating and uh, getting hammered by these um, lesser but more organized people. Well, yes, that's true, but it's also a fact that the world is populated by millions of very decent people. Absolutely. And if oh, yeah. we all got together and organized ourselves, our voices could be louder than the rest. But we won't do it because we don't think it's needed. We Most people just are not aware that it can be done and should be done, in my opinion. Any particular groups you think we should align with first? Or is it just an individual, or a, you know, the individual mom and pop across the planet? Do I think? don't. I don't know the answer. Okay. 
Just be the best you can. Very Always. Good. Very good. And I think, to, to me, the, the basis of leadership and power and the ability to guide or influence or affect is the fact that the only power you ever have is the power you give away. So does that tie back into that true leadership is to serve? Well, yes. That that principle is contaminated because it came from L. Ron Hubbard, whose motives and actions are not are open to some question. He was quite capable of saying the very right thing, not because he meant it and owned it, but because it was the right thing to say. And I don't mean to say that he was never sincere and never really positive. He could be. But he, if he was making some kind of official utterance as in an issue, then he would be he would be being very careful about the image it conveyed. Okay. The image could be more important than the message. And what, if, yeah, go ahead. I would say if. If I had ever told him that I think the only power you have is the power you give away, he would immediately have called me insane. So explain it then. I'm having a little bit of, of uh, difficulty wrapping it around my head. So the only power you have is the power you give away. I would interpret that to mean, like I said, serving others or helping other people become powerful in their own right, rather than just taking all the power myself. Am I along the right track there or am I totally off base? Well, I think that's a good question. I think what I'm looking at is that you the only power you have is the power you give to another to be himself or herself and to be right and to learn. Yeah. And to be to be on whatever path the person is on, in my opinion, whatever person whatever path any individual is on is the perfect path for that person. Gotcha. That makes more sense to me now. Good. Good. It's, all, it's also tied it ties into granting of beingness. Yes. Something I learned. It, yeah. All right. And it also avoids the situation that Krishnamurti was looking at. In the 1920s, Krishnamurti, who was a very wise man, he was pressured to take over leadership of the Theosophical Society. And he refused. Uh, I forget ex his exact words, I'm sorry to say. But it was he was saying, I think, you don't need a leader. Nobody needs a leader. A leader just causes problems. And if you think about it, as soon as the group has a leader, there are people who want to please him or her. And people who have disagreements but don't say so. People who have other agenda and don't say so. 
people who will go along and people who won't go along, people who are overt and people who are covert. So they, there's a, a tendency to fixate on the fact that the, the other person, the, the, the leader, is in charge and has that importance. And people want to be important. True. So that's my take. Yeah. Hence, we have a third dynamic. Hence, we have <laughs> issues related to that. Yeah, as soon as you organize it to a group, those, I mean, it's, I guess, it's kind of natural or obser definitely observable. <clears throat> where yeah. you have those dynamics happen, like internal dynamics, the group dynamics of like yes. power and how do you get close to that power, opposition yes. to the power. Literally, the first second you organize, like you take yeah. any group of people and you're like, this guy's in charge. It's like, why is he in charge? Why isn't Joe in charge? Why ain't I in charge? Okay, he's in charge. Yeah. I, I don't like his surrounding people, so I don't like him. Like, it's just, it gets weird, right? <laughs> it gets weird right away. On the other hand, you, you have to have somebody who has the last word in some situation. There has to be somebody who makes the decision. And I think that Ira Chalef has the very right idea in his approach to courageous followership. And if if I if I were ever to be in a position of quote leadership unquote, I would use that. I would also use I would I would incorporate John Kennedy's approach. He was the president of the United States. He could order any he could issue any order he wanted to. Sure. But in the Cuban Missile Crisis, when they found out that the Russians were putting nuclear missiles into Cuba, he had to act. And he was wise enough to know that the situation was so serious, he had to approach it very carefully in a very adult manner. And what he did was he set up a team to, to explore and design possible handlings of the situation. And at the same time, there was another team whose purpose was to knock holes in every suggestion. Mm. So that what eventually came out from the agreement between the two sides was, in fact, very sensible. And it worked. John Kennedy got on the phone with Khrushchev and they communicated. Yeah. And they did a Kennedy did a bit of a TR4. He found out what was worrying Khrushchev so much, and that was the presence of American nuclear missiles very close to Russia. So Kennedy, oh, sorry, go ahead. Senator Kennedy compromised and withdrew those missiles from away from Russia, and Khrushchev responded by taking his missiles out of Cuba. But Kennedy deliberately chose that approach so that he knew that the the proposal that came to him had been very thoroughly vetted. So right. that, I was going to interrupt you. Um, sorry, I, I am interrupting you. Just because it, right. today's parallels, uh, it seems like they could easily do the same thing, but to, there's no... Like, I think Kennedy actually wanted peace. I don't think this current administration actually wants peace. So that sensible solution won't be applied, unfortunately. Right. But it's a great solution. It's a great approach. It's a high-toned approach. It is. It makes sense. Right. Well, low-toned people don't go for high-toned approaches. No. As we know. Hence... Let's get people educated on the tone scale. <laughs> All right. It is um, 5.30 my time. We've uh, had a very productive day, I think. We've gone yeah. deep in philosophy and all over the place. Again, I'm, I'm very much enjoying these talks. We've right. through a couple of the questions that we've um, that I've had here. Still have plenty more. I think next time, just prepare yourself mentally because I think I want to get these RPF questions out of the way. Oh, dear. One, get that topic out of the way. Yeah. Uh, 
and and because uh, I know you've written about it kind of extensively, but let's hear your actual voice on the subject um, at our, at our next talk. And okay. uh, I'm sure people will be rewinding and fast forwarding that video over and over again as they <laughs> as they try to pick it apart. Okay, sir. Okay, I have to run. Okay, so I will see you on um, Wednesday. Wednesday. All right, sir. Okay, Wally, thank you very much. All right, good night. Bye-bye.